the 56th man to lead the Springboks in Test Match Rugby, Farid Dupreya. Kamelan off the back, there goes Farid Dupreya, the captain into the corner! The talent hits a target that nobody else can meet, but the genius hits a target that nobody else can see. Uh, he was the king of South Africa in Scotland. The Springboks with Dupreya, and they could be in again. The best player I've played with, there's only one name for me whenever I can think, and that's Farid Dupreya. And Farid Dupreya, that is a try for a the strategist. He is and will be regarded as one of the greatest minds that has played the game. Priya burst onto the local rugby scene in 2003 with some stellar performances for a revitalized Blue Bulls franchise. After narrowly missing out on selection for the 2003 World Cup squad, Dupree was given his first opportunity to stake a claim for the scrum half berth under new coach Jake White. Wonderful day for him and men's three to Priya, Eddie Andrews and Jacques Crenier as they make their debuts. Yeah, it was a massive, massive honor to get selected for the country. I think every every kid that grows up want to play for the country and want to be a Springbok one day. And, and um, obviously, my dad didn't have a privilege, and I was so I was so happy when I when I first got selected to the squad. Um, I just I can only remember the nerves. Um, I remember we were underdogs. We won it, and. Um, my, my recollection was that I just wanted to play my second test. What was the influence of John Smith as a, as a captain on that team? Yes, John's influence was massive. Um, he was selected just as Jake was announced. He was selected as, as captain by Jake. And uh, like I said, Jake's been visionary. And he knows where to make up with the team to be successful. And John was obviously a massive, massive part of that. He was always just very constructive, never any negative talk. And, um, yeah, well, everyone sort of learned from him and respected him massively. John Smith was equally impressed with Dupree's impact on the book camp. He sort of went about his business, trained hard, you know, uh, and fitted into a group without necessarily making a very big fuss about himself or, or his, his presence. The more he became familiar with the team, you know, the, the more of a leader he became uh, as well within the group. And uh, I say leader not in the fact that he was the kind of guy that would shout and scream before a game, but just in the fact that he always, under pressure, was able to give good advice. For he was always one of those guys that could just give me a, a quick, simple answer in a, in a very, very short period of time under pressure. The new coach made his ambitions for his young side clear immediately. I remember the first team talk we had, he said, listen, 2007 World Champs. And he said, listen, there's guys here that's maybe a bit young, but we want to win the World Cup in 2007. He changed our view of what we were going to do over the next four years by, in our first meeting, telling us that we were going to win the World Cup, which was you know, quite a, a big statement to make considering how, how 2003 went. The 2004 Tri-Nations gave this fresh new crop their first big test on the international stage. So the Tri-Nations, our first game was against the All Blacks in, in Christchurch. Berger still has it, the Springboks with the Priya, and they could be in again. We were basically ahead for the whole game, and, and Doug Haller scored in the last minute of the game. It was a massive disappointment not to win the game, but in that, we got a lot of confidence out of the game. We knew we could compete at that level, and we could, at one stage, at some stage, become the best team in the world. So we followed that up with, with Australian Perth. Um, I played against George Gregg in that game, which was one of my heroes as well when I grew up. And the same story we lost in sort of in the last minute. When we got back, um, unfortunately, um, I was selected to start the test match against New Zealand. And then two days later, Jack called me and, and said, look, there's, something has happened and, and I'll be on the bench. So that's a little bit of where myself and Jack sort of our first sort of friction came. I could understand his, his reason late, later on, but obviously I was very disappointed. Um, lucky enough, Swimmers played a massively great game against all those where Morris and those scored three tries. And then we were, we were in position to win the Tri Nations when it takes all against Australia and Durban. Again, I was on the bench, and, and the first half didn't go well. And at half time, Jake just pulled me over and said, Look, you're, go, you're going on at half time. That's it! That's it! The South African side have won the 2004 Tri Nations. That was sort of my first really, really good experience. Um, 
winning a trophy with the Springboks. You know, winning that Tri Nations, albeit by a whisker, you know, was huge for for our journey, uh, and we were, you know, it certainly put us on the right track and it gave us a belief in each other and the process and what we were doing and how we were playing. The new season saw Dupriya continue to battle for the hotly contested scrum half berth. And then the following year, uh, Ricky January was selected ahead of me. Um, after I was man of the match in the first test match against France. So it, it was tough for me, but um, it, it wasn't once where I thought, look, Jake this or Jake that. I respected the decision. I, I knew, like, look, I must work harder if I want to get to the top. Once you, once you sort of overcome that obstacles, you become a better player. So in, in that sense, I want to thank Jake for that. Dupria reclaimed the number nine jersey prior to the 2007 World Cup where White made use of another wise head to put the final touches to his side. Eddie made a massive, massive um, difference to the, to the setup of the team. Um, I think Alison had a, had a great job, um, but Jack sort of felt we just need something extra and um, just sort of a different opinion and, and a different viewpoint. And um, yeah, so it, it was massive for us. Yes, we really enjoyed Eddie. Uh, firstly, I think Eddie was a guy that loved to talk about rugby, so I think firstly it was nice to sit down and chat with him but then he also he understand about space he always talked to us when we must take the space when you mustn't take the space things we never talked about before in the game we were just like get over that vantage line boom 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 the little things that he did and changed especially in the background with our running lines and and the when to pass our, our different attacking options was huge in the way we attacked so Although he had a small role, his impact at that World Cup was huge. Butch James claimed the fly half berth in France and partnered to Pri as he and the Springboks stamped their authority on the tournament. Butch now goes for Rita Pri. This is dangerous for England. For Rita Pri goes. Peterson is there. This should be on. JP Peterson will score. He will score. It's that man. I think that was probably as close to a perfect game you could ever get a scrum off to play. You know, so everything Fari tried uh, worked. Everything he tried, uh, we would either score off or get a turnover and get the ball back. Peterson scores! It's the Rita Pierre game. He set it up. He also played a lot on impulse and, and what was in front of him. And JP Peterson's tried down the right hand side he saw the gap and, and took it fed JP and we ended up scoring so that was the kind of player he was he was always very good at sticking to our structure and to our game plan but when he saw the opportunity and 99% of the times it was the right chance for him to try something and more often than not it, it came off if people ask me about the perfect game that was probably the closest to the perfect game I've been involved in uh, and for Reece, uh play that day was probably the closest to the perfect game a player can play. You probably had the game of your life. Do, would you feel that from a personal point of view? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it was the game of my life, but it was a massive game in my career. Um, just the way it was, it was built up. Um, the previous years before the, before the World Cup, we always knew we were going to play England. They were the current world champions. And Jake sort of slowly, but slowly, always mentioned the game and mentioned the game. And as we got to that week, um, everyone was so focused, focused on, the, on the job at hand. And it was just one of those games where the atmosphere, I can say, was unbelievable. And, and everyone sort of soaked in that, that pressure and that atmosphere and, and just played an unbelievable game. It was a very mature performance from a South African side. They're growing by the day. This is four years culminated into today's match. 36 points to nil is a thrashing in anybody's language. I think it made a massive statement. I mean, 36 nil um, in a pool game. Um, yeah, I think is, is certainly a, a wonderful way to, to, to top the pool and, and to get what you need in terms of a certain respect or fear from those that are also competing for the World Cup at the same time. So, yeah, without a doubt, that was one of the big, big, big moments in World Cup 2007. That game was a huge uh, uh, confidence builder for us as a team. And obviously, into the quarters where a lot of the big teams did get knocked out, that also gave us a bit of confidence. Yeah, the World Cup's a long competition, so, you know, pressure builds and it builds and you get out of the group stages and then you know the pressure really starts to, to come uh, come on strong so you've got the quarter final the semi final the week of the final we were playing England again and we've already beaten them three times in uh, in 2007 
And uh, I think that final week there's a hell of a lot of pressure and, and there's no escaping it. You know? So when the game finally came, came along, we were quite relieved that you know, the game you know, has started. Welcome to the Stade Francais for the 2007 World Cup final. Give you all to read the players' feelings, you're in the change room and you're going to play in the World Cup final. Yeah, I, th I think uh, any player that, that grows up, they want to be a Springbok and then obviously you want to be the best in the world and you want to win a World Cup. Um, I was lucky enough in 95 to, to be at the stands. I was 13 years old. And in that week and in that change room, you sort of left back and, and, and think of 95 and you think what you've done during your life and the sort of massive opportunity to win this World Cup. And uh, it's massive, massive pressure, but I think that's the reason why we played the game. Um, and to live for moments like that. I think the nice thing about going into that final, it was like we knew if we play well, we will win. It was not like yeah, if they play well, it's going to be close or whatever. We knew it was in our own hands. If we go out to play well, we should win the game. We knew we were good enough to beat them, but you know, it's going to be, it was going to be tough 80 minutes. How can they get it up wide? England score, I think. It is left toe. No. Touch the line. Touch the line, I'm right. Yeah. Touch the line. It's touched the line. Balls on touch. No try. Even if it was were a try, we, we were, that whole game we were confident we were going to win it. And we did play a little bit more conservative, but if we had to, I think we could have played, um, we could have scored a lot more, more points. But it was just sort of that pressure. And, and at the end of the day, you just want to win the final. And then once we got it, eight points. Um, eight points, more than eight points eight. We knew look, we've, we've got this. They're not going to score a try. The 80 minutes is up. The time is up. The time is up. The referee's whistle goes. Another moment that was going down in the annals of South Africa's sporting history. How did you guys celebrate? <laughs> yeah, obviously the emotion was, was, was massive. Um, we worked, that, most of that team worked for four years, but very hard to to get to that moment and, and then you look, this is a massive moment for us, it's a massive moment for families and our fans and, 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 and for the world of South Africa. I think you just got them just, oh, it's done, we've done it. You yeah, got the victory and I think the first emotion you experience is just one of relief, you know, it's, it's glad it's over, you know, you've, you've finally, finally achieved what you set out to do. So look, I mean, I think in that 2007, we had a lot of players that were playing unbelievably well. Um, obviously, Fury was at the forefront. You know, I think uh, 95 it's, uh, had something to do, probably more political reason for South Africa, but 2007 it was generally just you know, South Africa being the best in the world at something, and uh, we were quite happy that it had to be rugby. That madman of a coach said we were going to stand around this cup. It was the first thing he ever said to us. So to be able to stand here with our president, it makes us really realize We've had the privilege of carrying a nation and now we get to carry that cup back to the nation. So, Ooh. thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. Yeah. The Springboks on top of the world and the influence of the Italian at nine couldn't be understated. Yeah, I think 2007, we all knew what we had in Fury. Um, you know, you go through phases in your career where you get on a roll and uh, in, your, in his case, he just kept on winning trophies in whichever team he played for. So from 2007 to 2010, the teams he played in won, won uh, pretty much everything. And him, you know, I think he went through a phase, you go through his phases in your, in your career where you're pretty much untouchable.